uh, I appreciate uh, you uh, adding to the donation bucket. As I mentioned this morning, we uh, uh, depend on your uh, generosity for our success. There's a barrel in the hallway as you leave if you uh, haven't had an opportunity to donate. Also, uh, if you don't need your folders, uh, as you leave, if you want to donate your folders back, uh, there will be boxes by the door for recycling your folders. So uh, it's a, a real privilege to introduce my good friend, uh, Lisa Graves, uh, and a really, uh, I think, appropriate title for her talk today, uh, telling the radical act of telling the truth in an era of fake news. Amen. What could be better? <laughs> Lisa. Lisa also will be our uh, dinner speaker this totally evening over the speech. speech. No. Totally different speech. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, don't uh, feel that uh, you're not you're getting the whole scoop. You're getting a, a appetizer here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Is that an alternate <laughs> There's a chair. There's chairs down here for folks who are standing if you want to. I'm going to set the timer so I can get you guys out of here. What time would I like to wake up? That's not good. <laughs> okay. So um, I just want to, can, can folks in the back hear me? Is that all right? Yeah. <clears throat> I just want to thank you all for, th first of all, Nate, Tim, um, really one of my dear friends. I know that uh, there's a league of volunteers who really helps put this together, but Nate has uh, really spearheaded this, and this gathering is so important, and I think now more than ever. And so uh, Nate, who I know is working tremendously uh, in his days and nights um, in his uh, non-profit capacity and th through the party work that he does to try to really uh, advance progressive values. He's a true hero. And so please give him one more round of applause. <laughs> so now I have the pleasure of actually opening my remarks with an announcement about cash, <laughs> which I never get to do, uh, which is I'm not giving away cash. <laughs> but someone has left an envelope of cash uh, for deposit on one of the tables up there, and it's full of cash. I don't know how much you have to know the amount in order, I guess, to get it. Um, but Julie, is that right? Julie has the amount and the bank information, so if you have misplaced an envelope of cash, please go to Julie, and not to me. <laughs> I do not have an envelope of cash for you. <laughs> so, it's good? All right. Um, Julie, will you just raise your hand one more time? Julie, if you're missing an envelope of cash. Or maybe you just want cash. <laughs> so, um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm actually th thrilled to be here. And there's three cameras, which means I can't curse, which is going to really be a bummer, uh, for <laughs> a bummer for you all, since I'm excellent at cursing. And my cursing skills have become even more excellent since November of last year. Uh, and you know, as a, as a fan of science fiction, I have been telling people I feel like I'm on the wrong timeline. I don't know about you, but like something happened, there's another timeline out there, and like I'm happy, you know, and uh, the world is not in this total chaos. But I'm on this timeline with all of you, uh, which is, you know, great. I'm great to be on this timeline with all of you because we have a lot of work to do together. Um, and Nate asked me to talk about uh, the work that I do for the Center for Media and Democracy. We, um, if you've heard the speech before, you're, you haven't heard it before, this is a whole new speech about the work we do, exposing the Cokes, exposing Trump, exposing the bad guys. Um, but we have a new website, you might not have seen, called Exposed by CMD. And um, that's a way to try to house our research together. But you may have been reading about some of our investigations in the New York Times, or The Guardian, or The Washington Post, uh, or MSNBC, other places, because we've been really busy fighting the bad guys. So I wanted to begin, um, and we're supposed to get out here at 4.30, right? Yes, yeah, so I've got 17 minutes. Okay. Um, so, 45, you, got, you can tell uh, quarter two. Oh, wow. Well, you have you might have questions or something. You might want to. Have okay. okay. So, um, so I, I just want to begin a little bit with um, sort of my thoughts after the election. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> wow, I feared this. I worried about it. I, I, I pondered it. I 
I imagined what might happen, and yet still it was worse. Yeah. <laughs> still it was worse. And, it, and I realized the day that Trump chose the head of Exxon to be the head of the State Department and be our top diplomat, that my imagination is in, uh, you know, incompetent, not sufficiently broad enough to imagine the types of just horrors and absurd choices that this man would make. Like, I thought I had a pretty good handle on how wild and crazy he was, but it's even wilder. Who knew? Who knew? And then they announced, I think last week, although it's a bit of a blur to me, in dog years, otherwise it was Trump years, but I think last week they announced that they were like only having a hard power State Department. Apparently they didn't get the memo that that's the Pentagon, and that the State Department's role is soft power, otherwise known as diplomacy. Um, not always effective, but you know, at least the theory is there. And so, um, the first week after the election, uh, I wept. I don't know about you, but I, I wept. You know, I wept. I don't say I wept like the entire time, but I wept, and then I slept, and then I wept some more. And then I went to the Supreme Court, and then I'd sleep, and then I wake up and I go, the United Nations, and then I'd sleep, and then I go, human rights treaties, and then I go to sleep, and then I go, Keystone. Like it was just an unfolding series of you know horrors. And then I looked at the 2018 congressional races, and I shrieked some more because it turns out you probably heard this. Um, well, first of all, the way the Senate works is that every two years, this is the depressing part of my speech, it's gonna get better, I promise. <laughs> but every two years, one third of the Senate is up. And it just so happens in 2018 that the one third of the Senate is up is like two dozen Democrats oh, and like a dozen Republicans uh, and a couple independents in there. Um, and the Republicans are from places like, you know, the South. Um, and the Democrats are from places like not the South, um, and otherwise known as some of these, you know, formerly blue, purple, now red territories or something. And so um, the Senate prospects look, you know, not good for taking over the Senate for the Democrats, for the Democratic Party, um, and um, having subpoena power. Um, the House, you know, majority Republican, uh, everyone's up in two years, so who knows what will happen if there's a wave of resistance that sweeps the country in terms of what may happen. Um, what can happen if there were a change in party um, is subpoena power, uh, impeachment power. Bills of impeachment begin in the House. They don't begin in the Senate. Um, so there are things happening in the national structure where I woke up and I thought, oh, well, that's a problem just from the standpoint of accountability because if, when you have one party rule, we've seen that in Wisconsin, what's one party rule like? Oh. Uh, you can't have hearings on things that actually matter. You have a bunch of hearings that are sort of fake trumped up hearings where you know you can't actually have things amended because it's all one party rule and um, and if even if you have a hearing it may be like super fast so they like pretend that they're hearing from you but they're not really interested in hearing from you that's what happens in one party rule one party rule I think sort of no matter who the party is is, is sort of bad um, I don't really believe in divided government per se I believe in functioning government but I haven't seen that for quite a while um, so anyway uh, after I sort of got through that first wave of sort of the shock, <coughs> um, and then the recounts were going on, and it turns out in Wisconsin, even when you submit an open records request like we did uh, for information about counting the votes, that you actually can't get information on the counting of the votes. Apparently no one really can, not the people who ran, <laughs> not other people. No one gets to see the ballots. I think that's a big problem. Other people have talked about this. There are whole books about this. The fact that we cannot see the ballots in Wisconsin and other states is a substantial problem. One of my researchers is from England. He says that in England, not a small country, they still vote by paper and they count by paper. Um, and the only reason we don't is Diebold? No, I don't know why. Uh, I don't know precisely why we don't count by paper, but I personally um, would join any effort, and this is part of my broader message, any effort to support these reforms, you know, paper ballots, um, you know, better counting process, better voter registration, the whole nine yards. Like, you don't have to just pick one. Lots of things we can be supporting now. I think that's one of them. Um, anyway, um, as I looked at the numbers, I had this sort of revelation, which was, um, again, <laughs> no, but I looked at the numbers, and obviously um, the popular vote candidate didn't win the election, Electoral College. And, um, and then I looked at the numbers some more, and I saw that like half the people didn't vote. I'm sure you saw that too. And you thought, who are these people? Why did they not vote? And then you may have thought, Oh, there are these other people who voted for Trump. What were they thinking? And then there are people who voted for Hillary. You might have been thinking, like, what were they thinking? Who knows what you were thinking? What I was thinking was, um, 
this situation in which half people don't vote is a, is a huge big deal. I don't need all those people to vote. It'd be nice if some more of them voted. Is that the person I is that the person I pay my you know I pay for gas to? Does that person that person not vote? Like who didn't vote? Um, maybe people were people felt like they didn't it didn't matter. Maybe they felt like they didn't like any of them, so they weren't going to vote. There's a whole array of reasons why people don't vote. But when I look at those numbers from the public policy standpoint, I think um, I could spend my time trying to focus on some Trump voter who posted anti-Obama racist things on Facebook. I don't think I'm going to persuade that person. That person has drunk so much Kool-Aid, I don't know why they're not red. <laughs> you know, they, they are not reachable. They, they say crazy things about Obama that aren't even in the ballpark of truth. This moderate Democratic president who, you know, was super moderate. Um, you know, I, I don't know that those individuals are necessarily my target audience. And I would say to you, personally, um, you may have had different revelations you experienced over the course of last year. I learned that telling someone that they're racist not persuasive. <laughs> true, true, maybe totally true. Apparently not my most persuasive argument. Hey, you're a racist. So, you know, I've learned that I've got to, you know, I'm not perfect, I'm still learning. And in my organizational capacity, I don't call people racist. Um, and at CMD, you know, we work to try to enlighten people and open people's eyes. But one of the things I discovered was I was spending a lot of time and energy thinking about the people who were totally crazy. They are not, I think, the people that we should necessarily be focusing a lot of our energy on. I want to focus on people who maybe didn't vote, who, think, who, who didn't think it would matter and may now go, whoa, it might matter, it might matter if I voted or not. So I did a little bit of look through the statistics and I found some statistics that you may have heard, but I'm going to assume that maybe you haven't heard them and so I'll share them with you, which are, um, and I knew this one, this one I knew because I lived it, like many of you. When George W. Bush left office, after crashing the economy and lying us into war in Iraq and, ru and ruining so many people's lives through that war, so many people lost their lives, he was still at like 33% approval rating. Still. You knew that. You knew that. Still, 33%. And then I thought, was this some sort of trend? So I went back through the Gallup polls all the way back to Nixon. You remember Nixon, right? <laughs> Resigned in disgrace. What was his approval rating when he was resigning in disgrace? 33%? Really? What is wrong with us? How is that possible? That's not me, by the way. Um, so then I thought, well, so maybe 33% of the population, just in general, supports kind of bad guys, no matter what. And, I, and, and I, I say that in part because it's not that I don't care about those people, I'm related to some of those people. <laughs> it's that I don't think I should be spending my time focusing on them so much. I want them to be happy, I wish that they could see things like, it's the health insurance companies that are with the death panels, not the government in the you know, fake claims of the ACA, the Affordable Care Act. I wish they could see things like, you know, the racism that is in our criminal justice. I wish they could see a lot of things. I wish they could recognize that climate change is actually happening. I don't know about you, but if I'd invested in snowmobiles in Wisconsin a couple years ago, I would be broke. Because, you know, the climate is changing. Even the USDA changed the growth charts, you know, so you know when you can plant your plants. Um, so, you know, I don't know, but I think that I would like to think about the people who um, maybe didn't vote or who, or who may, um, may not have liked the choices that they had and who want the world to be a better place, people who share these common values and, and vision. Um, and so I think it's worth thinking about that as a tactic. So um, then I looked at, um, I was looking at some election things, and I realized that what happens, this, is, this may be news to me and not to you, um, but I, I, I went to go volunteer on a campaign. I typically don't do that, actually. I do election protection stuff on election day. But I actually went to knock on doors, and I realized, oh, they're only knocking on the Democratic doors. Um, like I was skipping like five doors to every door, right? Because you know, and I only had an hour or something, and so I was following the list and knocking on the doors. But I was bypassing five doors every time, and that's just like kind of the efficient thing. All the pollster people say to you, you know, that's what you got to do. You got to just count count the doors that you get. But I I wonder in this new era. You know, whether people ought to be knocking on more, more of those doors or figure out a plan just to say, hey, I'm your neighbor, and we're in this together, and this is our country, and can't we do better? 
Shouldn't we be standing together to defend our public schools? Shouldn't we be standing together to defend, you know, health care as a right that we all have, that, that you don't just, it's not just like you're poor, therefore you die, or your pre-existing condition and then you die, like the, the song, the song says. Um, we have rights as workers, we have rights to organize, we have rights as citizens to speak out. Um, you know, I, so I understand the math on it. I'm just saying, you know, this is something I observe. So then when I was looking at some other things happening in Wisconsin in terms of the turnout, um, and I, I realized another thing that happens, um, well, one thing that happens is um, no candidate is ever good enough for, you know, at the national level, I think, certainly at other levels. They can't actually hold all of your dreams. They don't always fit all the things you want. Um, but in reality, there's a broader issue, which is that the parties, um, both parties have a branding problem. For God's sake, the Republican Party elected the Reform Party candidate, basically, Donald Trump. Um, and uh, the branding is such a significant issue that, in essence, the Kochs have basically been organizing around the Republican Party. The people who are getting out the vote, the people who are, um, the people who are out there trying to push the issues uh, throughout the year on the Republican side isn't really the Republican Party of Wisconsin. They issue faxes and things. But it's not. It's the Koch brothers. And they're not actually spending a huge amount in the state. Sometimes it's huge. It was like 10 million right before the recall. But it's actually not like a gigantic billion dollar billionaire sum. What they're doing is, from my observation, is that they are actually just connecting with people throughout the year. Which is interesting because the party, um, the parties and the Democratic and Republican Party tend to be transactional. You know, they get more engaged before the election. This is what a party does. A party gets more engaged before the election, and then it sort of recovers from the election and then goes away for a little while and does a lot of work. But it, it doesn't necessarily um, it doesn't necessarily build a grassroots movement. And a movement is something different than a party in many ways in modern America. And so what you all represent, what this effort represents, what the people who came out uh, for the Women's March represent is movement. And a movement, in many ways, just transcends a party. A movement is bigger than a party. A movement, in some ways, is better than a party. Movements, because they're about people being engaged on issues that they care about. And then they're the, the ambassadors for those issues with their friends. I care about this. You care about this. Let's do something about it. Which is different than being like wearing a shirt that says, I'm with a party. Which, you know, it can be um, powerful, can be valuable to people, depending on their perspective. But a lot of people aren't so party oriented. They don't necessarily want to belong to clubs, but they do care about things that affect their lives. And so I feel like um, as we came into 2017, this movement that has been unleashed is one of the most magnificent things I've ever seen in my entire life. Don't you think? It's just phenomenal to see so many people out. And the challenge is well, how can people stay motivated? How do you sustain this movement, especially? in this, the topic of my speech, in the world of lies that has overtaken <laughs> us. Uh, at one point we thought about whether we were gonna do like a lie of the day of Donald Trump. Oh. <laughs> it was too overwhelming. <laughs> there was too many lies. We're like, well, if, even if we just focus on Trump's lies and the tweets, like if we don't even count like Spicer or Kellyanne Conway or Con Woman or whatever, uh, you know, like how will we even keep track of it? We can't, like there's just too many lies coming out. It's like a lie. Like, lie in the, like, there's five lies at 5 a.m., you know, there's, you know, it's like, we just can't, we can't respond to all them, we're just like, by the time we've knocked one down, like, then the next one has, ar has arisen and is being repeated ad nauseum through social media, you know, so what do we do? In my universe, uh, in the nonpartisan world of CMD, in, in looking at issues, what we try to do is shed light on who's benefiting, who is getting screwed, sort of us, uh, generally, uh, and who's benefiting? Oh, Exxon. Exxon's benefiting in a big way. Putin, Putin benefiting in a big way, apparently. Um, major, major issues. And even though there may be some cynicism, like, does this really matter? Does it matter if people just keep believing Trump if he's at, I don't know, 33% or 37% or 41% approval? Like, does it matter? I think it does matter. Because the more and more we can spread our network, people who get who get facts, who believe in the truth, the more we can broaden the network of people who will stand up and resist uh, his incredibly extreme policies. And so that's what we've been doing. I'm going to take a drink of water all the way over there. <laughs> um, so um, one of the things we did was 
uh, shed a little bit of light on, um, on Jeff Sessions. <coughs> He's a liar. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you got that part from the confirmation hearing. He was under oath lying. Uh, but yeah, yeah, he's a liar. And in fact, I used to work uh, with him. Um, and by with, I mean near him uh, when I worked on the Senate Judiciary Committee. And he was a liar then. Um, I know that would be shocking to you. Actually, one of the most shocking things that happened to me was um, I had been at the Justice Department during the Clinton administration. And when they started to impeach Bill Clinton, I was like, lying is bad, you know, just so we're clear. Um, and then I got to the Senate and I realized all the guys that impeached him were huge liars. Yeah. And I thought, wow, they actually went to impeach this president about lying, which was bad, about sex, bad. Well, sex is not bad, but you know, lying about sex is bad. Um, see, I said on the record for the cameras, oh no. Um, anyway, um, bad. And then I got there and all these guys who were leading the impeachment, then the guys who were on the Republican side, they lied every day. And I can't tell you the number of people who, I would sit in those hearings and I'd go, wow, John Kyle, that's a lie. Uh, Jeff Sessions, that's a lie. And, and Jeff Sessions um, made a decision sometime around the time I was there to have a particular person who, who was his counsel who would sit behind him, who's an African-American guy. Jeff Sessions had a little bit of a problem with um, racial justice issues, you know, um, Martin Luther King's wife, you know, Coretta Scott King wrote a letter against him that Strom Thurmond, the racist who was the Dixiecrat president, didn't let see the light of day. Um, anyway, so William was, um, was the counsel for um, Sessions, and I'm going to share this story with you because it was completely shocking to me. Uh, William, uh, William would sit over in the corral on the Republican side of the Senate floor, and I was in the Democratic side, and um, at one point during the um, Bush administration, the Republicans were mad that we had only confirmed 98% of Bush's nominees. We had had the audacity to block 1.8% of his nominees, and so they decided to have round-the-clock debate to try to punish us, and they were busing in people to come into the um, audience above the Senate, the gallery. chairs, the gallery above the Senate. And one night at like 2 o'clock in the morning, among these three days of overnight debate, I saw a bunch of people come in, and I was like, hmm, more of these people, they bust in. Um, uh, William, African-American counsel, comes over to the Democratic Corral, and he says to me, Lisa, do you know who those people are? And I said, I have no idea, William. And he says, those are the real freedom riders. Uh, and I was oh like, uh, no, they're not. Uh, actually, what I said was, what? Uh, those are your words, William. Like that, um, those are not the freedom riders. Um, he said, those are the real freedom riders. Those are the real freedom riders. And he walked away. And I thought, I guess you can get away with that on the Republican side of the aisle saying that. But that's not actually true. The people that the Republicans bust in on little, you know, fabulous coaches to make a fake show of the judicial nomination issue, when we dared to block just a teeny tiny smidge of their judges, um, were not the people who risked their lives to guarantee people the right to vote. And if Sessions Council doesn't get that, that's a problem. But more than that, Sessions was a man at the time who was more than willing to defend uh, his buddies in Alabama when they were engaged in activities to basically get money from corporations to, in my view, corrupt the Attorney General's office. That may seem like something you've heard of lately <laughs> with Scott Pruitt, um, but in fact it's been going on for a long time. The Republican <coughs> Attorney General Association has been actively um, taking money from corporations, and then the Attorney General in those states would be, you know, not so hard on those corporations that they are raising money from. Imagine that. I call that corruption. Maybe it doesn't meet the technical definition of a bribe. It doesn't. But I still think it's corruption. It's offensive to our democracies. So I submitted evidence to the Senate Judiciary Committee about Sessions. Um, but since Senator McConnell wasn't up, I didn't get a chance to submit evidence about Senator McConnell. Um, so Senator McConnell, I'm sure you've heard of him. <laughs> oh, he's a liar, too. I know you're shocked. It's shocking. It's shocking. But again, um, in this sort of, you know, the lie fest that the Republican Party has in many ways made more manifest with Trump, um, I have to tell you this other little anecdote, which is at one point, um, we actually confirmed this guy for the Sixth Circuit. His name was John Rogers. He was a, a Kentucky law professor. He was a buddy of McConnell. Um, he's someone who would never, the Republicans would never have confirmed if he were a Democrat, because he had a theory of judicial philosophy 
which was that lower court judges should reverse the Supreme Court in advance to save them time. <laughs> this is otherwise known as judicial activism. I don't know if you've heard about these judicial activist judges. Anyway, McConnell was like, you have to confirm my guy, you have to confirm my guy. So, you know, uh, we had a hearing, Senator Durbin asked John Rogers, have you ever defended anyone who was less fortunate? Have you ever helped anyone with your legal career who was, you know, poor or a minority or disfavored? And, and John Rogers paused and he said, you know, I did defend the CIA when they were accused of opening New Yorkers' mail. Oh. <laughs> Senator Durbin said, not exactly. <laughs> not exactly so the sort of pro bono work that might reveal your character for good. But we confirmed that guy. That guy is sitting on the bench in the Sixth Circuit because McConnell refused, to, refused other things if, we, if, if he was not confirmed. So this is in my Lisa growing up sort of stories. Um, I go to the Senate radio gallery with my boss, Senator Leahy. Senator McConnell's there. The, camera's, the camera and audio isn't on yet. They're talking, and Senator Leahy says, Mitch, you know, we got your guy confirmed to the Sixth Circuit. And McConnell says to Senator Leahy, I know, we never would have done that for you, never. Thanks, thanks for doing that, thanks for doing that. Uh, we really appreciate it. And then the guy behind says, okay, we're on, three, two, one, live. And McConnell looks straight in the camera and he says, it is unprecedented to block the Republicans' nominees. It is unprecedented, unconstitutional, and outrageous. This is a paraphrase, but that was the tenor of it. Like, on cue, lied with command. That's who we're dealing with. We are dealing with people who are incredible liars. And they managed to right now be led by the most lying is that an adjective now in the 21st century? Man ever to hold the office. And, and you know, Nixon held that office. So, you know, um, the standard. Uh, anyway, so, um, so what else are we doing to fight these bad guys? Well, um, we had been pursuing Scott Pruitt, who's the, um, now the head of the EPA, for a number of years. Because of his role in this scheme, we consider this to be a scheme where attorneys general, who are supposed to be the top law enforcement officer in a state, are actually going out and soliciting money from the corporations they're supposed to be regulating. Then the money goes into this thing called RAGA, then it gets passed back out to help them on their campaign, and you don't know. You don't know about it. You don't know who they raised money from. You don't know that money went to them. But we know, because we have open records requests we've submitted around the country, um, but not from Scott Pruitt, because he refused to answer our request, basically. So um, we sued him. You may have heard that we sued him. We sued Scott Pruitt. Yay. <laughs> and we'd like to sue a lot more of them, so let me know if you want to help. But, uh, but anyway, um, you know, we sued him because uh, the public has a right to know. The public has a right to know how the Attorney General in Wisconsin is spending his money, apparently on little coins that he gives out at our taxpayer expense, outlandishly. Um, you know, uh, they were right, we have a right to know if our attorneys general, the top law enforcement officer in a state, is basically buddying up with the corporations that they're supposed to be regulating. You have a right to know. So we pers we've been pursuing that and we will continue to litigate that case. Um, okay, I've got six minutes, seven minutes. Um, Betsy DeVos, no. you've heard of Betsy DeVos. Oh, oh incredible. You know, um, I was looking through a bunch of really, really old videos of hers, and I found this video that we, we published a transcript of that was astonishing. So now on the sort of memory lane front, um, you've heard of Tom DeLay, right? Yeah. Is he one of the most honest politicians in Washington that they've ever seen? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> but Betsy DeVos, we have this tape that we found, um, you know, buried in the, in the millions of videos on YouTube, in which she is talking about how she's funding, she, the billionaire daughter of the Prince family fortune, who married into the billionaire fortune of Amway, uh, how she was funding the attack on campaign finance reform, how she was funding the attack on the bi what became the Bipartisan campaign, right, re campaign Reform Act, which was the McCain-Feingold Act that was struck down in part in Citizens United in 2010. She was funding the effort to try to crush campaign finance reform because she's a billionaire, um, on this tape, uh, in this video, she says two particularly astonishing things. This is leaving, leaving aside her entire career, and I use that term loosely, uh, to, on education issues. Uh, she, in this speech, she says two amazing things. One thing she says is, um, 
Tom DeLay is the most honest man in Washington. <laughs> I'm not lying. I mean, she is. Yeah. Uh, but I am not lying. She actually says, Tom DeLay, the most honest man in Washington. No one who is not deranged uh, would say that with a straight In fact, some people might say it if you paid them enough. But she's a billionaire, and no one paid her to say it. She said it because he was in her pocket. You know, He did her bidding. You know when Trump said, no puppet, no puppet, yeah. a puppet uh, to, those, uh, to Betsy DeVos and company. The other thing she said that you should know about, and so many people here have been active in the effort to the move to amend effort, and efforts to amend the Constitution in the, in the wake of Citizens United, the other thing she said was that she's, she believes in these guys because they're fighting for her right to speak as loudly as she can. Mm. Meaning to spend as much money as she can to get what she wants. Now we uncovered other things she said about, you know, the idea that the public schools had somehow displaced the church as the center of the universe <laughs> in an America that isn't a theocratic country uh, in which we have a First Amendment that's not having a, supposed to have an establishment <laughs> of religion. Um, she said other things that we helped uncloak, and we helped uncloak how she helped fund the group that pushed the massive expansion of the destruction of democracy in Michigan to expand the powers of the emergency managers, which led directly to the cataclysm in Flint. Um, so we uncovered that. Now, unfortunately, there weren't enough votes in the Senate to stop her, but there was a tremendous outpouring against her. And so I guess what I would say to you in the closing parts of this, uh, these comments are, um, even though she's on the, at the head of the Department of Education, um, even though she won, in essence, that seat, um, your voices were not in vain. Those voices, that effort, really galvanized senators to stand up, to have backbone, and it galvanized a number of people who were not awakened to the issue of how under threat our public schools are. And so, you're, so even when we don't particularly win a battle, for example, we, meaning the collective um, forces of good, uh, defending the public schools and the public commonwealth and the idea of public institutions, um, we can build, oops, we can build strength for the broader movement. Oh, no. <laughs> oops. One more time. All right. And the reality is, um, the reality that we have to face is that this is a long-term fight. Even though it felt like some people lost the fight in one day, it wasn't lost in one day, and it can't be won in one day. And what we have to develop is that resilience. The resilience to know that this is about not some sort of policy issue, not some sort of, you know, section 22 of a bill. It's about our values. It's about who we are as a people. And when we speak up, when we speak out, it has an impact. It may not have an impact on one particular election day, but it has an impact on our country as a whole. And the majority of the country is not down with this craziness. The majority of the world is actually not down with this craziness other than maybe Putin. Um, you know, it is, we are, these progressive values are the majority values of America. The elections have been a poor proxy for demonstrating that, in part because of the redistricting gerrymandering that has happened in our state and other states, in part because of the dark money that's flooding in, uh, in part because of other um, factors, an array of other factors, but the reality is, is that when our issues come for a vote, overturn Citizens United, overwhelming majorities, um, support raising the minimum wage, overwhelming majorities, having paid sick leave for people, overwhelming majorities. Um, when our issues, when progressive issues have a chance to be voted on as issues, maybe not through a particular candidate, they prevail. And we can prevail, and we have to remember that. This is part of a longer, a longer battle for our values. Now, in my neck of the woods, I'll tell you the two last stories as we wrap it up. Uh, one is, as we still continue to fight Alec, you've heard of Alec, right? <laughs> so, you know, we uncloaked in 2011, uh, Alec, the American Legislative Exchange Council, where corporations vote uh, as equals with your lawmakers, like Bukmir and others here in uh, Wisconsin. Um, and a whole array of the, the Republican Party in Wisconsin uh, who attends these out meetings and other states. Um, one of the things that we have continued to do is shine a spotlight on them. Um, last year, you may not have heard this, but in fact, last year we pushed uh, out of ALEC through exposing their role in ALEC and ALEC's climate change denial and more, we pushed Ford Motor Company out of ALEC. Oh, yes. <laughs> Through 
our efforts and the efforts of uh, brothers and sisters in labor and more, we pushed Enterprise Rental Company, the biggest rental car company in the world, out of ALEC. Uh, through, through our efforts and the efforts of our colleagues, we pushed Expedia, the biggest online travel company on the planet, out of ALEC. And though we were shocked to discover it, uh, we, and we exposed the fact of it, that AARP was funding ALEC, we and you helped push AARP out of ALEC. So there's more I could tell you. Uh, I could go on and on. If I got paid by the word, my husband does say I would be a millionaire. <laughs> but we haven't found that job yet. Um, so there's more I could tell you about our, our tremendous successes, even uh, in the midst of the cataclysm of uh, 2016. There's more I could tell you. And to hear more, you'll have to come to dinner. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, um, but the bottom line is, the bottom line is, is that I, uh, as an ordinary citizen, am honored to be here in Wisconsin with all of you, with each of you, and all the many things you'll do and you're doing to speak up, to stand up, to email, to call. Um, and I'm honored to be part of the Center for Media Democracy, which is located here in Wisconsin, here in Madison, to stand up and speak out against injustice, to uncloak the bad guys, and to help, uh, help us create a, a better democracy, a stronger democracy that represents us all and not just uh, the corporations and the few billionaires like the Koch. So thank you so much. I, I want to thank all of you for uh, being with us today. As you know, this uh, enterprise is put on by a collective of uh, at least 75 people who make the event happen, and a steering committee of the Wisconsin Grassroots Network of about a dozen people. So uh, when you uh, think about it, think about the fact that there's a lot of people who make this happen, including yourself, by attending today. Thank you very much.